Right, let's go ahead and start. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to all to this, the, the last actual uh, lecture in the STEG virtual course on key concepts in macro development. Today's lecture is a supplemental lecture. We're really delighted to have Klaus Desmet here to talk about urbanization and development. It's um, wonderful of you to join Klaus and this is our 20th lecture. It is um, really wonderful to see so many people who have stuck with us throughout, and I'm delighted to welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to give special thanks before we begin to the team from CEPR, which has made it possible to put together this lecture series and has done the work behind the scenes, um, keeping material up on the website, loading the recordings onto YouTube, so I'd particularly like to single out um, Mandy Chan, Kirsty McNeil, Lauren Waring, and Nadine Clark, who've done an amazing job and made this and made this work. The, the course is part of the STEG program. And as we've said many times before, and at the risk of boring those of you who are now hearing this for the 20th time, STEG is a research program. STEG stands for Structural Transformation and Economic Growth. It's a research program funded by the United Kingdom's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office as part of the UK aid effort. It's managed by CEPR in London. And um, we've just been really very fortunate to find colleagues across the profession who've been willing to contribute lectures to this series and to put a stock of knowledge out there that we hoped would lay a groundwork for doctoral level teaching on this topic, which isn't really offered in any one institution. And so um, this lecture fits in perfectly. The question of how urbanization relates to development is one that's obviously really fundamental to the processes of structural change and sectoral movements. Before I turn things over to Klaus, I just wanna reiterate some of the ground rules, which will also be familiar to all of you. Those of you in the virtual front row will control your own cameras and microphones. Klaus says you're more than willing to interrupt with questions as he goes along. Please feel free, don't be shy. For those of you who are not in the front row, the way for you to ask questions is to pose them in the Q&A um, section. So use that feature. Um, Klaus won't be able to see those questions, but I and Joe Kaboski will do our best to answer as many of those questions as we can. And the ones that we can't answer that are really hard and difficult, we'll hand over to Klaus and make him answer. Um, and I think that's, I think those are the key bits of information that we need. So again, without further ado, I will turn things over to Klaus and please go ahead and, and share your slides. Um, for those watching, the slides are all online. I'll, I will make sure that the link gets to you and uh, please feel free to follow along. Klaus, over to you. Thank you, uh, Doug, for the kind uh, introduction. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to be here today and uh, to be able to talk to uh, all of you about this important topic, uh, development and uh, urbanization. So uh, I will uh, divide my um, lecture today in two parts. Uh, most of it I will dedicate to the discussion of uh, one uh, particular paper uh, which I wrote a couple of years ago uh, with uh, a colleague with uh, Esteban Rossi Hansberg on um, determinants of uh, the city size distribution. In particular, in that paper, we looked at the role of three important determinants in the, the city size distribution, uh, productivity or efficiency, amenities, 
and uh, urban frictions. Uh, and then we apply actually our methodology to look at the US and China. And so you could ask yourself, uh, how is this uh, related to, uh, to development? Well, of course, uh, as you all know, uh, the development process uh, is typically accompanied by um, uh, urbanization, by people moving from uh, rural areas to, uh, to cities. Uh, and that leads to a number of uh, challenges, right? So for example, uh, there's always this big question whether some of the world's uh, mega cities uh, are becoming uh, too big, right? And this type of approach that I will uh, be talking about to you today will be able to uh, give you a framework uh, to think about that question and to actually quantitatively uh, assess uh, that question. Uh, so, so, so that's one reason why uh, we think this is important. Another reason is that, uh, as you all know, in many, many countries, uh, governments uh, are very worried about the spatial distribution of uh, economic activity, right? So maybe development is too concentra concentrated in particular areas and they want to uh, spread it uh, over the territory. And once again, you can ask yourself, is that a reasonable uh, policy or is it not? You know, what are the welfare effects, for example, of a policy that would uh, uh, promote growth in, uh, for instance, medium, medium sized or small sized cities? Is that something that makes sense, right? So it may make sense from a territorial perspective, does it also make sense from a welfare perspective? So all these questions one, one can ask uh, by, uh, by applying the methodology uh, I will uh, be talking about today. Uh, and then lastly, maybe as, as part of the motivation is that uh, we think there's a lot of value in uh, comparing urban systems uh, across countries, right? So as I said, our, our, our initial analysis was done uh, on the United States. It's obviously not a developing country, but you know you can learn a lot from say, let me take this particular approach. Let me uh, do the same exercise in China. Let me do the same exercise in Mexico. Let me do the same exercise in Nigeria and try to understand uh, what are the similarities? What are the differences? Uh, what can we learn from one country for example, might it be the case that China is slowly moving into, in, in the direction of uh, the urban system that we have in the US? And if so, uh, what does that imply in terms of uh, future gains or losses in terms of uh, welfare? Right? So there's lots of interesting questions here. And so that's going to be uh, the main part of my lecture. And then towards the end uh, of the lecture, I will want to talk a little bit about a few other papers, uh, just to give you a flavor of the other work that has been done and that is being done in the area of uh, urban economics and development, or even more broadly, uh, what we could call spatial economics. Uh, and development. So the difference a bit between urban and spatial would be urban is mostly focusing on uh, uh, cities, uh, as the word itself says, versus sp a more spatial economics approach, a more economic geography approach would would be a little more comprehensive and take uh, take the entire territory uh, or the entire geography of a country, including uh, including say uh, uh, rural areas, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so without, uh, uh, without uh, holding you up further, let me uh, now turn to uh, the model. Uh, I will explain this in some detail and then show you some graphs and then move on. Okay, so, um, so as I told you in the beginning, uh, we will be looking at uh, three determinants of what makes a city, an attractive place to live, right? So one determinant could simply be uh, that 
the location has a high level of productivity. So I can move to a city, be highly productive, earn a decent wage, and that makes the city attractive. Uh, a second reason could be attractive amenities, right? So people don't only live in cities for productive purposes. They also live in cities for uh, uh, consumption purposes. In fact, it's something that, that Doug has written about and hopefully we will get uh, to, to talking a bit about some of his work as well. Uh, and then lastly, um, uh, some cities are of course better than others in terms of uh, uh, managing what we call frictions, but you can think of frictions as urban costs, right? And this is particularly important in developing countries. So we all know that, that cities are great places to be productive, uh, that density is a good thing. Uh, it, 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 helps us, it helps us be productive. But on the, other, on the other hand, it also leads to urban costs, right? Cities tend to be congested cities tend to be polluted, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and some cities are better at managing that than others, right? Um, so, so, so that's, those are the three determinants we're gonna look at. And then the second uh, element of the approach is that we will not look at a single city, but instead we will look at the entire system of cities. What that means is if I take say, the US or I take China, I'm gonna take all the cities in the US or I would take all the cities in China. And what's important about that approach is that um, this is a general equilibrium approach, meaning that if um, one city uh, is attractive, for example, that may be because the city itself has some good features, but it also may be because other cities are less attractive. Right? So it's a system where people uh, can, can move across space. And so how well I do uh, will obviously depend partly on how well others do. And, and I think that approach of a system of cities is important because very often when we think about urban policy, urban policy is very often run by city governments. Right? And so a city may say, I want to do this to make my place more attractive but that doesn't necessarily mean that that is the best thing to do from a systemic uh, point of view, right? And so taking into account uh, the entire system of cities, I think is, is, a useful, is a useful approach. And so once we have this model and once we can quantify it, we'll obviously be able to run some counterfactual exercises and the counterfactual exercises will be a little bit uh, along the lines of what I was, um, talking about in the, in the introduction, I can, for example, look at would it make sense uh, to uh, support smaller cities? Would it make sense to uh, uh, try to uh, slow down growth uh, in, uh, in bigger cities, etc. right? And then, as I said, we will compare uh, the US uh, and China. Okay, so um, the model. We have a system of uh, I cities each city will be characterized by a level of productivity, by a level of amenities, and then a level of what we call excessive frictions, which reflect this efficiency of providing uh, urban infrastructure that deals, with, uh, that deals with congestion. I'll have to be a little bit more specific about that third point in a, uh, in a second. Okay, and then we'll have uh, N agents or individuals or households, and they can choose where they live and work. And so the urban equilibrium will be one where utility uh, equalizes across uh, space. So in terms of technology, uh, so we have goods that are being produced in these different cities. Uh, as I said, uh, a city I will have a particular productivity, uh, AIT, and then uh, production will depend on that productivity. It will depend on capital and it will depend on, uh, on hours worked, right? Uh, capital will be freely mobile across space. So there, there will be a common, uh, a common interest rate. In terms of preferences, we will say that preferences depend on your consumption, right? It will also depend on 
your leisure, right? So I have one minus H, where H is the hours you work. The more you work, uh, the less uh, utility you have. So I have consumption, I have leisure, and then I have this gamma term in here, uh, gamma I, I is a subscript for a particular city, uh, which will denote the city's amenities, right? And so we'll take that as a, as a fixed characteristic in the exercise we're doing. Uh, that just could be that, you know, if your city is one of the students, I can see you have the Golden Gate Bridge behind you. If your city uh, is uh, located in the San Francisco Bay Area, well, that's just a nice location uh, that will add to the amenities of, uh, of that place. Right? And so, so then the agent will obviously maximize utility subject to a, to a budget constraint. And without going into too, too many details here, I just want to flag one thing in a budget constraint here or a few things. One is that, um, that there will be a tax rate tau, right? Which is levied on uh, uh, people's wages. And that tax rate tau is actually what's going to finance the urban infrastructure, right? So people are going to be living in, in, in the city. They will need to be able to commute to work and the city will have to provide urban infrastructure uh, call it roads or commuting infrastructure, and that will cost something. And that's what we're going to be calling it. Uh, th that's going to be financed by this tax style. Uh, uh, R will be referring to the fact that uh, people live on, on land and they need to pay uh, rent. And then T will refer to commuting. But I will get, I will get to that in, the, in, in a second. Um, OK, so you can, you can solve this. Uh, this uh, utility maximization problem, and you get this first order condition, right? Which obviously will depend uh, on this uh, tax tau. Uh, and so this tax tau will distort, uh, obviously, your, uh, your, uh, your optimal decision of how much you want to, uh, how much you want to uh, work. Right, because it's a tax uh, on labor. And so sometimes in the literature, rather than calling this tau a tax, uh, some people prefer to refer to tau as a, a labor wedge. Uh, what's the difference between the two? Uh, the difference between the two is uh, tau as a tax is obviously a very concrete concept. You say, okay, there's a tax rate of say seven and a half percent, and that's what I'm gonna call tau, versus saying, no, 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 tau is anything that kind of distorts my decision of uh, how much how many hours I want to work, and that could partly be taxes, but it could partly be other uh, maybe frictions or regulations or things that uh, have to do with the context in which I live, which, which distort my decisions. And so if you take that broader view, then we would refer to Tao as a labor wedge, right? And so what you have to understand is that when we call it the labor wedge, it's partly referring to taxes, but it could partly be referring to other things. Uh, and it's a bit of a black, black box kind of approach where, where we don't really uh, want to be too specific of what other things might be in that tau, right? And so anyway, um, that's just a bit of a, of a side note here. And then, as I said, agents uh, will be uh, freely mobile across cities. And so uh, utility will uh, equalize across space. Okay, uh, so uh, right for now, I haven't really said anything yet about uh, what it means to be a city. The only thing I've said is there's these different points in space that have different productivity levels, different amenity levels, and different taxes. And then people will allocate themselves across space until utility equalizes across all these points. But what exactly does it mean here to be a city and can we give some more structure to what it means to be a city, right? And so a very standard model that is used in uh, urban economics is called uh, the monocentric uh, city model. Uh, and so the monocentric city model, uh, what it tries to, um, what it tries to kind of conceptualize is the idea that uh, uh, cities are not only productive places, but cities also uh, cause some kind of congestion because people need to live somewhere 
and then they, they need to get to work, right? And the monocentric model, uh, the assumptions it makes is that production happens at the city center, right? Call that sort of the central business district. And then people uh, live in concentric circles around uh, that city center, uh, of course, at different distances, right? They go away from the center. Uh, we will assume that every uh, individual occupies one unit of land. And so as more people move to the city, the city will grow and the distance from the furthest away uh, resident to the city center will, of course, also grow. And so then you face a trade-off, right? The people who are going to be living further away will have to commute longer distances, right? Commuting is costly. You can model this in different ways. You can think of commuting being costly in terms of time. Uh, we, uh, we model it here in this particular paper as commuting being costly in terms of goods. Uh, and so the commuting cost TD, D being the distance from where you live to the city center will be Kappa D, right? So some kind of a, a parameter times a, times the distance. Um, now, as I said, people live on, on, everyone lives on one unit of land and pays a particular rent, RD, which also changes with distance. And we will normalize the price at uh, the price of land at the city border, sort of at the fringe of the city. We will set that equal to zero. You can set it equal to a concept, it doesn't matter, but we'll set that equal to zero. So RD bar, D bar where D bar is the, the city border, let's say, right? The, fur, the point furthest away from the city center. We'll say that the rents over there are equal to zero. And then we will make the assumption that all agents in a city can choose where they live. If everybody can choose where they live, then the sum of the rents that you pay plus the uh, commuting cost that you pay, that must equalize across people. Right? And what that implies is that the person living furthest away from the city center will pay the highest commuting cost, actually Kappa D bar, but will pay zero rents. And then the person living closest to the city center will actually be paying essentially zero commuting costs, right? But will pay the highest rents. And so you have a, what they call a rent gradient. And that's a very typical thing that we see in urban economics, it's something which is very well studied. The idea that rents uh, tend to decrease with distance uh, from the city center uh, because uh, it is compensating people for, uh, for longer commutes. Anyway, and so we have this setup. And so then you can, of course, if you say everybody lives on one unit of land, if I have a particular population, NIT, in the city, Right? I can calculate how big the city should be. I can calculate the radius of the city D bar. Once I know how many people live in the city and how big the city is, I can actually also calculate the total miles traveled. Right? How, how, what is the total amount of commuting that is being done in the city? And what's interesting about that, as you can see in this, this expression here, is that this is actually convex in... Uh, in uh, the number of people who live in the city. And that gives you a little bit this idea that yes, as cities grow, maybe the productivity may go up, but there's also you know, congestion costs or these costs of, of size are also increasing in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a convex way. And that is actually important for the following reason. If, if, if congestion wouldn't be um, increasing in a convex way, uh, at the end, everybody would want to live in the same city, right? Which would be, say, the most productive city or the, the, the city with the best productivity slash the best amenities, right? And so we, of course, know that in reality, not everybody lives in the same city. There's many cities across uh, the territory. And one, one important reason for that, of course, is that uh, there's a limit to how big a city can be, right? And so if you think of a city stretching uh, 100 miles, for example, but at some point the city becomes too big uh, and it becomes too costly. Congestion becomes too costly to, to deal with. And, and so uh, new cities would be formed. Okay. Um, 
So that's kind of the setup. Uh, then uh, lastly, uh, um, so, so we have the city, we have this need to commute. Uh, the government, city government in this case, will have to provide uh, urban infrastructure, transport infrastructure uh, to, uh, to, to have these people, to have its residents uh, commute. And what we will assume is that the, the cost of providing this transport infrastructure will depend on the total commuting cost, which is this, this expression here that you saw at the end times the kappa. And it will also depend on wages, right? Of, of a worker, a worker's wage is actually W times H. But then it will also depend on this, uh, uh, this variable, which we call GIT. And this is what we will call the inefficiency or the frictions or this excessive frictions uh, of, of uh, different city governments. And so to be, to, be, to be very clear, what we kind of mean by G is the following. G, G is not referring to the fact that bigger cities become more congested. It's, it's more the idea that if I take two cities of equal size, right, that are equally congested, right, in, in terms of how much commuting happens, etc., some city governments are better, are more efficient at uh, dealing with this than others. They're, they're more efficient at providing this infrastructure than others. The one that's more efficient would have a higher G, sorry, would have a lower a lower G, the one that's less efficient would have a higher G, right? And so that's why we, in the paper, we refer to this as excessive frictions because typically, yes, as cities grow, frictions increase, but, but given those, that increase in frictions, some, are some, some city governments are better and some are worse at, at actually providing those, those uh, that infrastructure, they're better or worse in terms of uh, dealing with, uh, with those frictions. Okay, so, so that's kind of the idea. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, all these costs of providing transport infrastructure is then what will be uh, um, financed by that labor tax tau. Okay, um, all right, well, um, then of course, characterization of equilibrium is actually very simple. As I said, you know, people just uh, allocate themselves across space. Uh, until utility equalizes. And so what we really only need, so, so just to, to sort of simplify a bit, the only, uh, the only things I kind of need to know to solve this model is if I have information on productivity and on amenities, right? If I, if I have information on A, I have information on gamma, and I have information on this efficiency or these frictions with which governments uh, um, supply infrastructure, just GIT. If I have a triplet, if I have this triplet for all cities I, then I can actually solve the model, right? I can meet, and by solving the model, what I mean is I can tell you how many people will live in every single place, right? Which is the main thing we're looking at because once I know that, I can of course start looking at what does that mean in terms of city size distribution? What does that mean in terms of welfare, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And of course, as you can imagine, the, in, in equilibrium, we will find that more productive cities will be larger. We will find that cities with better, larger amenities are also larger. And then we will find that cities with these higher excessive frictions, higher GIT will be smaller, right? And so what we will do now is I will show you very briefly how we get data on, these tri on, on this triplet for all metropolitan areas in the US. And then I can show you what we do in terms of exercise. Uh, and, and then I will uh, show you what we do uh, for uh, China. And the comparison between the two will actually be, I hope, uh, quite uh, quite interesting. Okay, uh, are there any uh, questions on uh, the model part? <laughs>
I was wondering a bit um, how realistic it is to have these taxes be, um, being like on a city level. Yeah, so, so, so uh, you're, you're actually quite right. Some of the more simple urban models would just say, look, let us just uh, consider productivity and amenities as the two main characteristics that make uh, cities different. Uh, and that's kind of enough to understand most of uh, uh, the insights we can get from urban economics. Uh, here, as I said, uh, and, and that's why, uh, you know, that, that's why your, your question is useful. Um, you can think of it as being a tax and then you can, of course, ask yourself, yes, well, how, how might, how, which part of these taxes are actually local taxes, which part are state taxes, which part are federal taxes. It's obvious that part of the urban infrastructure will actually be, let's say, city roads, right? They, they, they typically are financed by uh, property taxes, which are local taxes, right? And so from that point of view, we think uh, our assumption is actually quite reasonable. Uh, a lot of the local commuting infrastructure is actually financed uh, by, uh, by local taxes. Uh, but, but again, it's a bit of a broader concept. Uh, you can go beyond the idea of, of, of strictly thinking of, of it as being a tax and go to this idea of a labor wage, which would, which would simply be telling you that some cities seem to be more efficient in terms of dealing with say congestion or dealing with urban infrastructure than others, right? Um, yeah, so, the, so those are the two parts of the, of the answer. When, when we, when we uh, sort of get estimates of this tau, and when I, I actually correlated those estimates of tau that are sort of predicted by the model, and, and I compared it to uh, uh, local taxes, the correlation is actually quite high. So, so, so it correlates well, our notion of tau in the model actually correlates quite well with uh, with uh, uh, local tax. So that's that's what I can say about that for now. Um, anything else? Any other quick question? Klaus, I have a clarifying question for you in the Q and A from Radhika Goyal. Linking this back to the misallocation lectures that people have had. Yes. If people relocate to a city because of amenities, not productivity. Yeah. Can that lead to misallocation in the aggregate? How do you think well, about that? What's, uh, what's interesting, of course, is that uh, when you have only one characteristic, so suppose we say the only thing we have here is uh, productivity, then, then, then all these predictions are relatively straightforward, right? You want people to go to places that are more productive and leave places that are less productive and you're done. Over here, uh, it's a bit more complicated because uh, not only do we have three determinants, but uh, the question is, what are the correlations between them, right? Is it typically the case that higher productive cities are also higher amenity cities? That may be the case, yes, or maybe no. And so, uh, um, uh, so, so, so what, what we can say is that if people move to cities with higher amenities, that will of course be, uh, that, that, that will improve their uh, utility, right? And so it will improve welfare, but, but it may actually decrease, uh, it may decrease efficiency if it turns out that the higher amenity cities are cities with lower, uh, with lower efficiency, right? And so if you, take, uh, if you take a view of misallocation as only referring to misallocation from the efficiency point of view uh, versus if you take a view of misallocation from a welfare point of view, right? And so we're talking here about welfare. Uh, and so, yes, it is possible that uh, as you are maximizing welfare by letting people move where they want uh, and they might be going to places with better amenities, that, uh, that efficiency actually goes down. That's possible. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, hello? I also have a question about yes. the uh, labor tax. Yes, uh, I I'm I'm not sure whether I understand it right, but uh, uh, in the production function, you, it seems that the labor tax doesn't 
distort the production ethic. So the wage it, is what it does is it 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 affects. Uh, if you go back here, it affects the choice of the hours worked, right? And so you can kind of see this here from uh, the Tau entering into your uh, into your uh, budget constraint. So so the Tau will depend on the hours you work. So it's not it's not a sort of a, it's not a tax that's fixed per person. It's a tax that depends on how many hours you work. And so when you think about uh, equalizing marginal uh, marginal benefit and marginal cost, uh, higher labor taxes will uh, push you towards uh, working uh, less hours, which is something you can see in this first order condition here, right? And so, so in that sense, it is a, it, it, it's a sort of a standard uh, distortionary uh, labor tax. Okay. Uh, um, anything else? Okay, uh, one more question, sir. Yeah. Um, how about uh, the, the 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 key assumption is that the the cities are homogeneous, right? Uh, in in what sense? I mean, are we looking at the structure and um, the factors that uh, determine uh, these cities are common to all? Is that is that is it clear to say? Yeah. That? So so well so so. Uh, so of course, each city has a different, so here, as you can see this AIT, the gamma IT and the GIT are really the, the, the three fundamental drivers. And so the only thing is that the I, so, so the structure is the same, yes. Yeah, so the, the model is of course the same model and what makes one city attractive or another is the same types of determinants, but, but they do have an I uh, subscript, meaning these are, three characteristics which are city specific. So different cities will obviously have different levels of these three, uh, of these three uh, determinants. But otherwise, yes, the structure, the structure is the same for all the cities. Okay, how do we account for uh, endowment? And maybe some cities are endowed with certain, uh, maybe resources. Um, yeah, so, so yeah. that would actually, in the, that would show up in, our, in, in a higher AIT. Okay. okay. Right, so a, a city that is, for example, either well endowed with some natural resources okay. or maybe uh, located in a port, in, in a place port that's, city, uh, yeah. that's yeah. easily accessible, that, 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 would, that would show up in the AIT. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, and so then what do we do? We have data on all these metropolitan areas in the US. Uh, production we measure by uh, GDP. Consumption, we don't really have data on consumption by, uh, by MSA, by metropolitan area. And so we actually use uh, retail earnings and then adjust for national averages to get, uh, to get um, a measure of consumption at the city level. And we add to that uh, uh, housing, uh, housing consumption. Um, capital, we take actually US uh, sector capital stocks and allocate it to MSAs according to uh, their shares in, in sector earnings. And then for hours work, we use uh, the current population survey. Um, so how do we get AIT? AIT, we just get from uh, this expression here. So we have a measure for Y, for K and for H. So we get AIT uh, that way. The labor wedge, uh, of course, we need some assumptions on what psi is and, and theta, et cetera. But we have a measure of, of C, of H, and of A, so we can back out tau. Uh, then the excessive frictions, GIT, we actually take the govern, government budget constraint. Uh, uh, we take logs, and then we run this regression here. And the residual is actually uh, what we call... Uh, uh, is the log of GIT, so we can back out GIT this way. And then the amenity levels we, we, is kind of a residual, right? So we, we use the model uh, and then um, uh, determine uh, the amenity levels gamma IT so that the model generated uh, distribution of people across cities actually matches the one we see in the data. Okay, um, all right, so let me, um, and then we also have a way of getting, uh, uh, getting an estimate of kappa, uh, 
right? Kappa is, if you remember, that's the cost of uh, the cost of commuting per per mile or per kilometer uh, traveled. Okay, so so with all of this, we can you know once we have the as I said, once you have these triplets for all the MSAs uh, and you have parameter values, you can just uh, allocate people across cities and, and 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 then you can start doing some exercises. Okay, that's that's the nature of. Uh, what we're doing here. Uh, here's one graph, just sort of introductory uh, to, because you'll see a lot of these uh, types of graphs. So the, these types of graphs, uh, you may have seen in other lectures or in, in, in your career in, in economics, uh, this type of graph to represent size distributions, you know, farm size distribution or whatever. Here it's the city size distribution. And so what you have on the X axis, the horizontal axis is the <clears throat> log of population. And what I have on my y-axis is the log uh, of the probability of being bigger than the population on the, on the, on the x-axis. So that's a little bit of a, of a mouthful, uh, but, but the way to maybe easier for me to say is the way to interpret these, these graphs are, if the graphs are flatter, right? say the red one or the orange one, uh, then you have more dispersion in the city size distribution. You know, on the top, the top are kind of the smaller cities, right? So I have more small cities and I have more large cities, right? So it's a little more dispersed. If, if it's a little steeper, right? Then there's less dispersion, <clears throat> meaning, uh, the city sizes are of more equal equal size, and so, <clears throat> excuse me. Just as a as an example here, for instance, if you compare uh, the red, the red, uh, the red curve to uh, the blue one, the red one is for a lower level of commuting cost than the blue one. So think about what that means intuitively. If, if I increase commuting costs, who is that going to be bad for? Well, that's typically going to be bad for cities where there's a lot of commuting, right? So that will be bad, let's say, for the bigger cities, right? And so higher kappa would tend to make the bigger city smaller and the smaller cities bigger, right? That explains why the blue or the light blue curve is kind of steeper than uh, the red one. So the red one is for lower commuting costs. It's not as costly to be big. So I see a more dispersed city size distribution. Uh, for higher commuting costs, I see a less dispersed uh, city size distribution. Okay. Um, and of course, then you can look at utility and welfare, etc. But let me move on in the in the interest of time here. So so here's the first uh, exercise where what we do is the following. Uh, we say uh, what would happen to the city size distribution if, for example, we eliminated all productivity differences across space. Right, uh, or what would happen to the city size distribution if we eliminated all amenity differences across space? Uh, and so, just just to explain a little bit better, the blue curve in all four pictures is the actual city size distribution, right? The ones that are colored in 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 another color, not blue, are counterfactual city size distributions. So let me. Uh, for example, uh, uh, call your attention to the one on the top right. Uh, so the green curve is the city size distribution that I would get if all cities had the same efficiency level in the US, right? The purple one here, the bottom left, is what would the city size distribution look like if all cities had the same amenity levels? And, and the black one is what would the city size distribution look like if all cities had the same level of, uh, of excessive frictions. So what you see uh, is a couple of things. For example, if you look at efficiency, uh, 
eh, you know, the city size distribution doesn't look that different. There's a little bit, uh, you know, there's maybe a little bit, there's a, some more smaller cities, but on the top part of the distribution, you don't really see a very big difference. In terms of utility, equalizing efficiency of cross space, eh, you know, the utility goes from 10 to 10.12. So there's a little bit of a improvement in utility, but again, it's not a whole lot, right? So the, the welfare effects is kind of an increase by 1.2%. So the welfare effects of equalizing efficiency across space in America is actually not that big, although you do get a lot of reallocation. So the reallocation here is measured by uh, the, the increase in the population in the cities that are growing divided by the total population. So you do get a lot of reallocation, a lot of people moving across space, but the city size distribution is not changing very much. And overall utility is not changing very much either. And so you look at these utility numbers here and that's true for efficiency. It's true for uh, equalizing amenities across space. It's true for equalizing uh, um, uh, excessive frictions across space. But, but in all three cases, the reallocation is relatively big. Welfare effects are relatively small. City size distribution doesn't change very much, maybe except in this particular case where you get a much less dispersed uh, city size uh, distribution. So that's an interesting first observation, right? Uh, you can of course uh, do many things with this uh, rather than looking at the, 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 the entire distribution. You could say, let me look at certain particular cities, what happens to them. Right, so for instance, let me look at efficiency here. If you equalize efficiency across space, look at the city size distribution, you don't see that much happening. But, but when you look at the data for individual cities, the effects are actually quite big. Yeah, well, not surprising, the most efficient cities will obviously lose. That's what happens when you equalize efficiency across space. Of course, others that are less efficient will gain, right, and so, uh, at the individual city level, you see big changes. That's of course what then explains the big reallocation across space. You know, there wouldn't be bigger reallocation across space if, uh, if uh, there's no big effects at the local level, right? Uh, the same is true with amenities. So if you equalize amenities across space, the East Coast would gain. What does that mean? Well, that means that these places don't have very good amenities. Right, because if, if they get the average amenity, they'll do better. The West Coast loses, but that would tell you that they actually have good amenities. If you give them the average amenities, they will end up doing worse. Um, right, so, so there's lots of interesting, if you're interested in particular cities, there's lots of interesting insights. Uh, and, and there's lots, as I said, lots of reallocation, but not a whole lot of uh, welfare uh, gains. And you can look at this in maps. Uh, for example, one interesting thing is that if you eliminate or if you make all these frictions equal across cities, uh, the places that are going to gain are the brown, the brown areas. So you see a lot of the cities actually in the Rust Belt uh, would be gaining a population if they had the same level of frictions uh, of the rest of the country. I thought that was kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting finding. Uh, so lots of lots of uh, cool stuff you can do with this, um, uh, but let me uh, let me now uh, for the for the remaining ten minutes before I sort of switch to the second part of the lecture. Let me actually uh, talk a bit about uh, China. Okay, um, so so we've seen this exercise for the U.S. Let's do the same exercise for China, right? Uh, well a couple of interesting differences. Let me focus on the one of productivity. Then I'll talk a bit about amenities as well, but let's, let's look at the top uh, right graph over here. So once again, the blue curve is the actual observed city size distribution. The green one here is how would the city size distribution look like in China if 
everyone had the same level of productivity. Okay, so the first thing you notice is that, uh, as you can see, this curve has become flatter, right? Flatter, remember, means more dispersion. The bigger cities are actually becoming bigger. The smaller cities are becoming smaller, right? Uh, that's interesting uh, because, you know, we've talked a bit about uh, mega cities. Are mega cities desirable? Are they not desirable, etc.? Here we're kind of finding, hey, you know, if everybody had the same efficiency level, uh, we would see even bigger cities than the ones we see today in China. And the cities are, as you know, already very big in China. Right? And so if anything, uh, we'll see more big cities and bigger big cities in China if, if efficiency, efficiency equalizes across space. The other very interesting thing here is, remember in the case of the US, we had a welfare increase of 1.2% uh, when you equalize efficiency across space. Here you have a welfare increase of 46%, right? Or 47%, uh, it's of course log point, but let's, let's just call it 47% here. Huge difference, huge welfare gains from equalizing efficiency across space. So, so that of course ties in, I think, probably with some of the discussions you've had on uh, misallocation in your, uh, in your other lectures. And, and so what is very interesting to me about this is, uh, you know, at some level, it shouldn't maybe surprise you, right? And the reason why maybe this shouldn't surprise you is, well, as with many other uh, emerging economies, uh, uh, you know, the difference in efficiency or in productivity across space in China is way, 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 way bigger than the difference in efficiency across space in the US, right? In mature economies, yes, of course, there's more efficient places and less efficient places in the US, but the differences are not that big. In China, these differences are on order of magnitude bigger. They're large, right? You take the, you take the most advanced cities on, uh, on the eastern seaboard in China, the, well, these cities are uh, very similar to uh, cities in very advanced economies. You go all the way to uh, Western China, and you will find uh, cities that are still very far behind in terms of in terms of development. And so uh, that's interesting uh, uh, to observe. And so in that sense, yes, obviously there's a lot of misallocation. Well, it's not real misallocation because the efficiency is whatever it is, but but there's misallocation in the sense that you know, the efficiency hasn't spread to all these places yet. If it would, uh, then uh, then you would see these big, uh, you would see these big, uh, you would see these big uh, uh, welfare, welfare gains. Uh, the other thing that's in interesting about this counterfactual exercise is that, of course, if you say, let me uh, sort of fast forward a couple of decades, right, maybe 20, 30, 40 years, we kind of know where China is heading. Obviously, because of technology diffusion across space, it's very clear that these very large efficiency differences across cities in China will become smaller, right? That's the standard thing that happens uh, with space and development. Development typically in the early stages is very uneven across space, but then eventually uh, efficiency diffuses across space making efficiency more equal, right? And so we, 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 if you had, I mean, of course we don't know, but if you had to make a prediction, it's very likely that the spatial differences in efficiency will become smaller. And if that's true, then it's very likely that we'll see something like this happening in China and that the potential welfare gains from that are actually pretty, pretty large. And what's interesting about this exercise is that when we say we're making efficiency equal across space, it's not that we're giving everybody the best efficiency in the country. We're just equalizing it to the average, right? So we're not increasing, we're not increasing average efficiency, right? The population weighted efficiency is the same uh, as, 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 as the one in the data, right? We're just allowing it to be more equally spread across, uh, across uh, the geography. Right? And so uh, we, we thought that was very interesting because it's, it's really 
very, very different from what we saw in, in the case of the US. And again, big reallocation, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, so uh, a few more things uh, before I uh, finish with this uh, part of, uh, of the lecture um, is, uh, is the following. I just want to give you a flavor of what other types of exercises could you do with, uh, with, this, uh, with this framework. So uh, one thing we did is um, we looked at uh, uh, a policy or we compared a policy that would target uh, uh, lagging cities, meaning cities that are behind in terms of either efficiency, amenities or frictions versus uh, a policy that would target either medium-sized or small cities and, and try to look at what would give us uh, the greater or the bigger welfare effects. And the reason why we wanted to look at that is because China, for a while at least, had this policy, which I mentioned here at the top in, in italics, of controlling the big cities, moderating the development of medium-sized cities and encouraging the growth of small cities. So you can say, okay, what would happen if we actually gave incentives for small cities to grow? Would that be a good thing? Uh, so, so here's what you see. For instance, if you look at the first row of the table, this would be what happens if I take the worst cities in terms of either efficiency, amenities or frictions, and I improve, let's say, their efficiency by 20%, okay? Or I improve their amenities by 20%. What are the welfare effects in the aggregate, right? You get a 5% welfare increase, you get an 11% welfare increase in amenities versus if you target the same type of policy, but you look at the smallest cities. So you, you increase the smallest city, you improve small cities by 20%, you typically get smaller effects. Uh, so anyway, uh, what, what, what this means is you could use a framework like this to, uh, to look at different policies, right? It doesn't make sense to target the smaller cities, right? Uh, or, 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 or again, does it make sense to try to slow down growth in big cities? Is that, is that a reasonable policy from, uh, from the welfare point of view? Um, so, so that's that's kind of the framework here. We actually in a, in a, in a, in, a, in another paper also compared uh, this exercise, or we implemented this exercise for for Mexico. Uh, and in Mexico, you find something which is somehow somewhere in between China and the U.S., but actually much more close to the U.S. than to China. Right. So we don't find particularly high. Uh, welfare effects in Mexico either. They're a little bit bigger than in the US. And so, yes, it's somewhat in between, but, but it's much closer to the US than, 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 than to China. Uh, but anyway, it, what the good news is, if you're interested in this type of approach, the data requirements to do these types of exercises are relatively mild. You don't need a whole lot of data. Uh, and as I said, I think there's a lot to learn from uh, doing this type of analysis in different countries, right? We learned so much by doing this for China, right? I, 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 for, for in some sense, I feel that this paper became really interesting when we did the China exercise, right? Just because the comparison uh, taught us so many interesting things. And, and again, China is obviously just one country. It's an important country. And it's an interesting country, but there's other countries out there. You know, there's an urbanization is happening everywhere and it's not happening in the same way everywhere. Right. And so, you know, maybe it is interesting to do some of these exercises in, in some African countries that are going through a process of, of, um, of urbanization, or you can do this for other South Asian or South American countries. Again, there's a lot to learn from doing this. Uh, for for countries that are going through a process of urbanization. In, in some sense, there's probably more to learn from those countries than from doing this exercise for uh, France or for uh, 
Italy where things are fairly stable. And so you can probably guess more or less what you will find. Okay, uh, the, are there, is there any quick question before I uh, move on and uh, talk very briefly about a few other papers? Okay. Uh, uh, I I was thinking about uh, is there a way we can introduce like uh, friction related to uh, human capital in certain thousand like only people with some minimum level of and educational attainment uh, are allowed to be in a place as opposed to people who are not uh, as an do they create more productivities or? Yeah, so so I so you're asking about whether there's any role in these models for human capital, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, there is. I mean, we we obviously in the paper that I have presented, uh, I haven't said anything about human capital, but there is a large and growing literature in uh, in urban economics that has been looking at what they call sorting, right? And it's typically sorting of people with different skills to different types of cities, right? So you're absolutely right that cities are different, not just because of some kind of exogenous level of productivity. They're also different because they attract different type of people. And there's growing interest in that. So for a while, if you go back, say, 50, 60 years, the, the typical urban, the, the urban models that were looking at city specialization, uh, uh, they were they would typically look at sectoral specialization. They would say, oh, that city produces cars, and the other city produces furniture, and the third city produces something else. Now there's much more interest in not really what they call sectoral specialization, but uh, functional specialization and and sorting of people of different skills uh, to different cities, right? So uh, what makes a city an attractive place for someone who's highly educated, right? Uh, and it's a very important question and city governments are obviously super interested in that because they all want to attract those types of people. Uh, maybe they are looking for urban amenities, right? Maybe they're looking for uh, like-minded people. And because of that, you get these you get this phenomena of sorting, right? So people, people want to live in a place, partly the sorting happens because of productive reasons, but partly the sorting also happens because of uh, utility and consumption reasons, right? As pe people may just want to live in a particular area or a particular city or a particular neighborhood because they find like-minded people, right? And so uh, being attractive for human capital is, is interesting. Again, in this particular paper, uh, we, we didn't consider uh, heterogeneity and skill, but that's something that could be introduced. And as I said, there's, there's lots of interest in, in urban economics in those, in those types of questions. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, okay. just a, a really quick one for you. Um, in, in these models, does Zipf's law hold for city size distribution? Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So so yes, it, I mean, the Zip's law holds, uh, as you know, for, for typically for, for pretty much all the city sizes, size distribution. So, so yes, typically it holds. Where sometimes it breaks down a little bit is uh, at the very upper end, you know. So there's some, if you look, say, at the top three or top four cities across uh, in different countries, it's not obvious that Zip's law uh, holds there. You know, you have some... Uh, countries where the, where the biggest city really has, say, half of the population. And then the, the ones that kind of fall below that uh, don't quite, uh, you know, so, so the, at the very upper tail, it doesn't, doesn't, nece doesn't necessarily hold zip law. But, but let's say in, in the model that we present, there's nothing that, that generates zip law. I'm, I'm just more talking about does it hold in the data? Right. There's, there's, there's nothing in the model because the model is not really a model of, of, of uh, dynamics, right? So, so there's lots of interesting models that, uh, urban models that generate Zip's law. You know, they sort of have a model where there's, there's particular shocks that happen and these shocks over time 
lead to a city size distribution that, that actually satisfies a Zip's law. Uh, this, this is a very interesting literature as well. I um, we should probably let you move ahead here. Yes, let me move ahead. And, and uh, I just want to, in the second part, in the remaining 10 or 12 minutes that I have, I want to mention a couple of other issues in urban economics and development, just to broaden the discussion a little bit. Okay, so, uh, uh, so let me start with a handbook uh, chapter that I wrote with uh, Vern Henderson a, a couple of years ago, where we kind of look uh, at the question of what do we know about the spatial distribution of population and how that changes with uh, development. And so one approach that will be very familiar with you be, for you because you've studied uh, structural transformation in so much detail uh, over the past uh, uh, weeks and months is uh, there, there's, there's models where we say, okay, if the income elasticity for food is less than one, then of course development uh, will lead to industrialization, right? And when uh, development leads to industrialization, uh, then kind of that also implies urbanization to the extent that industry tends to be more urbanized than agriculture, right? Uh, of course, another approach, which you're also familiar with from your classes on uh, structural transformation is you can uh, have made the assumption that the elasticity between food and non-food is less than one. In that case, industrialization results from uh, higher productivity growth in agriculture. And so uh, that kind of, uh, um, that kind of means that uh, to, have an, uh, to have industrialization or to have an industrial revolution, if you wish, you need to first have an agricultural revolution, right? And so you get, you get productivity growth in agriculture that moves people into industry. And industry is simply more urbanized than agriculture. And that's partly because, of course, industry is less land intensive, right? So, it, it tends to be more concentrated. And secondly, it may also be more concentrated because there's more benefits from proximity in industry than there is in, uh, in agriculture. Okay, now if you move a little bit forward and say what has happened in say the last decades in the US and in some other uh, developed uh, countries, what we see is that uh, although industry, yes, uh, urbanized in the early uh, time period. If you look more recently, we see growing spatial dispersion of manufacturing. Manufacturing is still relatively concentrated, but it's becoming less concentrated across space across uh, over time. Whereas with services, we're seeing the opposite, right? Services typically used to be sort of the industry, as you know, which was non-tradable and, you know, wherever people that were where, where, wherever people live, you have services. So services is extremely spread across space, but we see growing spatial concentration uh, of services. And again, that, that may be related to land intensity, uh, which uh, I said was lower in manufacturing than in agriculture, but it's of course even lower in services than it is in industry. And so services are displacing manufacturing in uh, cities and, and manufacturing is becoming geographically more uh, dispersed. It may also have something to do with the life cycle of industries, right? As industry matures, uh, there is less need to be close to each other because closeness is particularly important in the, uh, when you're learning, right? When, 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 the, when technology is new and there's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of benefits from uh, proximity. Uh, maybe that's more true now in some service industries than it is in manufacturing industries. And so these manufacturing industries no longer need to be spatially concentrated and are dispersing versus services that are becoming more uh, um, concentrated. And that's a similar pattern. You know, we looked at this in the US and we've looked at this in Europe. Other people have looked at this in other countries, for example, in Korea, that's something that's very well documented. So when industrialization happened in Korea, Seoul was the main manufacturing center. Uh, in the last decades, that's no longer true. What we've seen is industry mo moving out of Seoul into, uh, into uh, other areas. Um, okay, uh, now let me uh, 
switch quickly to something else here. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, very briefly discuss a paper by by Doug and uh, Remy uh, Jedwa and Dietz Falrath, uh, who looked at this at this very interesting observation, right? Where you know, as I said in the previous slides, the the standard the standard view has been development leads to industrialization. Industrialization implies urbanization. Uh, what they documented in a paper is that there are many places in Africa and in the Middle East where we see huge increases in urbanization without seeing big increases in industrialization. And, and, and the way they explain this is that what really matters for urbanization is growing income, right? And growing income does not necessarily have to come from industrialization. Growing income could also come, for instance, from having a higher income from natural resources. And so the sort of idea is that, okay, we have natural resources, say gas or oil, but our income goes up. Uh, we're not industrializing, but as our income improves and grows, we want to spend our income on stuff, right? And we want to live in a city uh, to enjoy the city, to be able to spend money in the city. And so this is kind of the idea that when we think about cities and development, we shouldn't think only about cities and development as cities being productive centers. Uh, cities are also consumption centers, right? And, and that's true in some of these places in Africa and the Middle East. It's, it's actually also true in some of, uh, some of the developed countries, right? I mean, there's, there are many people, some of the rich people in the world who want to move to say a city like London, not to be productive. They just want to live in London to enjoy London, right? Of course, London is a very productive city, right? Because <laughs> lots of people are working there, but there's a growing uh, share of the population who are just there to enjoy the place, right? And so if you have a lot of money, you also want to spend it. Where can you spend it? Well, you can spend it in, in some of these uh, uh, big, uh, big cities. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm slowly going to um, be wrapping up here, uh, but I wanted to mention just a few more things. Uh, another really interesting paper, uh, recent paper on uh, development and, uh, and, and space is this paper by Henderson and others in the QJE. So what they look is, what are the, what they look at is what are the determinants of the global distribution of economic activity? Right. And so they look at the entire planet and they look, uh, they, they use satellite lights, right, to measure the level of development or the level of the distribution of economic activity across space. And they say, let, let's kind of look at two groups of determinants. Let's think about the determinants that are important for agriculture. So maybe the soil quality or the temperature or whatever, or the precipitation. So you look at certain uh, factors or determinants that are important for agriculture productivity. And then they look at certain determinants that are important for trade, meaning access. How well am I connected to the rest of the world? Maybe am I a port? Am I on a big river uh, that, that facilitates trade? And they come up with a very, then they run a bunch of regressions, but they come up with a very puzzling finding, which is that it turns out that agriculture so these group of variables, which we could call agricultural determinants, explains much more of the variation in uh, the spatial distribution of economic activity in developed countries than in developing countries. It's puzzling in the sense that you would say, well, in developed countries, nobody's doing agriculture anymore. How come agriculture seems to determine where people live? And I go to developing countries where agriculture is still very important, and there it matters a lot less than in developed countries. And so the explanation they come up with is that uh, in the early developers, let's say today's advanced economies, structural transformation out of agriculture into industry happened at a time when transportation costs were still very high. And, and that means that at that time, cities tended to be located in agricultural regions. Right? So just sort of go back 200 or 300 years right? and think about it in the following way. Where did cities grow? Cities grew in places where there was agricultural surplus. 
right? So that there was enough to eat for everyone and some people could start doing other stuff. So they moved into cities uh, to, to, to dedicate themselves to other productive activities. But of course, once they were in these cities, they still needed to eat, right? And so where did they get the food from? They sourced that food locally, right? Uh, and, um, and they had to source it locally because transportation costs were still very high. And so the point is that in advanced economies, cities tended to emerge in places that had a productive agricultural hinterland versus in uh, less developed countries or later developers, if you wish, where trade was already relatively cheap, uh, that wasn't really needed. And so cities could emerge in places that didn't necessarily have, have, uh, have an agricultural hinterland. Let me wrap up with uh, one last thought here uh, related to uh, space and sector specialization, etc. cetera. Um, uh, I will just take one minute. I, I realize I'm going a little bit over time here. Uh, but I've been working in the last years quite a bit on uh, models, uh, spatial models of uh, climate change, right? And so why is that interesting in the context of this course, I think? Well, of course, because uh, on the one hand, you need to think about space because different places are gonna be affected differently uh, uh, by, by global warming. But you also need to think about sectors because obviously agriculture, depending on where you are, may be much more affected by global warming than other sectors, right? And so we will see big shifts in where different things are gonna be produced uh, because, of, because of climate shocks, right? And so we can look at you know, different maps and we can do different things uh, with these types of models on, you know, uh, here, this last thing here is looking at um, in the year 2200, um, where will agricultural output happen? This is part B uh, in, in a world without climate change versus in a world with climate change, which would be C. So, so that's very interesting, I think, as well, sort of thinking about not just urban and space, but think urban space plus sectors, right? Agriculture versus other sectors, how that might be impacted by uh, climate change. I'm going to stop here. Uh, I went a little bit over time and I'm happy to take uh, any questions you might have. Fantastic. Thanks a ton, Klaus. Um, let me open things up to the front row first. Hi, Klaus. Thanks for the presentation. Really interesting. Um, going back to the that first model where you have the AIT term for cities, yeah. I guess, how, how would you think about making it endogenous? Because I could imagine- yeah, so, so actually one thing we, we, we did do, and I didn't mention, uh, uh, we did a number of exercises where we endogenized AID in the following sense. Uh, as you know, in, in urban economics and in economic geography, uh, there is a lot of evidence that AIT is made up of two components. One is kind of exogenously given, maybe relates to one of the questions we had before. You know, maybe, you know, you have better amenities, sorry, you have, you have better endowments or you're in a more favorable location. Uh, we could think of that as being exogenous. And then an endogenous component that is related to size, right? So bigger cities uh, tend to be more efficient because they're bigger, right? And there's a lot of estimates out there. And typically the estimates range somewhere between uh, an elasticity of somewhere between uh, 0 0.02 and 0 0.06, meaning when you double a, a, a city in size, the productivity would go up by uh, somewhere between two and 6%. So, so that's the way in which we endogenize the AIT. You could of course go to a fully dynamic model in which you also think about innovation and incentives to innovate and how that may be different across uh, cities because different cities have different markets. And if I'm in a bigger market, I may have a greater incentive to, uh, to engage in local innovation. Uh, that is actually in the, in the, this last 
couple of slides that I showed you, these models with climate change, uh, actually also, those are fully dynamic and look at, 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 the, at the incentives to innovate. In, in, the, in the paper on urban with, with the AIT, there we endogenize simply in terms of uh, bringing in city size as an additional determinant of uh, city productivity. Thank you. Yeah. That was a question from Stephen Barlow in the Q&A, really kind of a complex of questions about COVID and, and um, yes. the extent to which we may be seeing a change in the pattern of people working in city centers. How much does that motivate a rethinking of the standard urban model? So the, the, that, that's a really fascinating question. Uh, and, and I will answer it maybe in two different ways. So um, I was recently reading a paper by uh, Nick Bloom and, and some other people at Stanford about, you know, will, uh, will work at home, will that stay or will it not stay? And I think they come up with some kind of number that probably 20%, uh, uh, there will 20% of work will be done from home. Uh, now, the very important question when we say 20%, just to say a number, right? Suppose we say 20% will, will be done from home. Uh, it's very different if you say every individual will say work four days in the office and one day at home versus saying 80% of the individuals will work five days a week in the office and 20% of the individuals will work all, all five days from home. Uh, if you take those two uh, cases, they would have very, very different implications for, uh, for city sizes, right? And for the urban model. So if, if I take the second case, which I sort of feel is a more reasonable one, but I'm not 100% sure. If you sort of say, we'll move to a model where many people will work one day a week or maybe two days a week from home, then you could imagine that cities may actually become a lot larger, right? Because the easiest way of modeling that would simply to say, look, my commuting costs are gonna go down by 20 or by 40%. And you know, if I need to commute every day, an hour in and an hour out, that's too much. I mean, the average commute in America is about 30 minutes in and 30 minutes out. It seems like more than 30 minutes, people don't have a lot of patience for that. But, but if you only have to do this three days a week, you may be perfectly happy with 45, 60 minutes. It's okay, right? If you do this three days a week. And so cities could actually become a lot larger uh, because the urban costs are going down because you don't, don't need to do it every, every, every day versus the other uh, model where you say, no, no, there's just gonna be 20% of people who will never go into the office. Well, then of course, those 20% those become completely footloose. They could be anywhere. Right? And we've always had some part of the labor force, you know, people working, you know, as, as telephone, uh, how I answer telephones and customer service. They may just be living in a small city somewhere in, uh, in, in anywhere really, right? And they don't need, uh, they don't need any of that urban, urban uh, they don't need any of that urban environment. So, so depending on where we're heading, the, 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 the effects may be quite different. Uh, another another uh, small uh, thing related to COVID is uh, there is some evidence uh, uh, that there is again a growing demand for uh, living in the suburbs because there's a growing demand for space, right? And so that may also, of course, change the structure of cities, right? Uh, in the following sense, in our model, I made the assumption that every individual lives on one unit of land. That's obviously a simplifying assumption, right? It's true that as you move away from the city center, uh, people tend to live on bigger and bigger plots of land, right? If you bring that into the model, and if you start thinking that uh, the demand for space, there's a shock to the demand for space because I'm gonna be working more at home, for example, right? I need some more space if I'm gonna need a home office. Uh, that may change that rent gradient and that may change uh, uh, the compactness of cities and the, the, there may be some effects uh, 
there may be some effects there as well. Uh, another rela related, and I'll stop here because I realize there may be some other questions, but another really interesting uh, question, at least to me, is what's going to happen to these uh, agglomeration economies, right? Uh, so, so, you know, if, if you look at agglomeration economies, uh, as I said, these are the agglomerations you get from density, but, but we as economists, we think of those economies as being external, right? They're externalities, they're external to the individual. They may even be external to the firm. So if you allow individuals to choose whether they go to work or not go to work, or even if you allow firms to tell people what they should do, right? Uh, th those decision makers are not fully internalizing uh, these agglomeration economies. So there may be some th there may be some bad surprises in terms of productivity if if uh, this is taken to an extreme. Uh, the example would be: suppose we now all change our preferences and we all want to stay at home always. Right, uh, you know, the, it's a very big question. What would happen to these agglomeration economies? Right, and I think that's a fascinating question, and and uh, and it's not obvious that that the so-called decentralized economy uh, will bring us to uh, a place that's uh, that's good. We don't really know what's going to happen to that. Any other questions? Yeah, I wanted to ask a quick question. Um, actually, it's it's sort of two. So one was a more general question because you were saying in, on the first part as well that you, yeah, you don't even need that much uh, data to make great analysis using that simple model. But um, this said, is there any like very innovative or interesting data source for um, yeah in in the context of urbanization you would like be able to point out to us? Um, yeah, and the second and the second question I have was referring also to this first model. Yeah, where it's not entirely clear to me how um, maybe different, yeah, costs of of actual goods in the city might enter, like how how differences in prices and not just rents um, enter into that model and how they matter. Yeah, th and thank you very much for this awesome yeah. presentation. Yes, thank you. Uh, so in your first question is a fantastic question. Uh, and I don't have a very good answer. Uh, but what I do, what I, what I, what I can say is that uh, the world of uh, spatial data is really exploding, right? And so there's more and more information available at the local level. And, and, and people are using uh, uh, very creative ways of getting at these data, right? So, so of course, the one example is using satellite data to, uh, to measure uh, local economic activity. Uh, but there's also people who have looked at, uh, uh, at more, uh, who've looked at, for example, uh, data on parking lots of uh, shopping malls to try to understand the uh, retail activity at the local level. You know, how full are those parking lots and how, how, what does that tell me about, uh, about uh, uh, the economic cycle? So, so, so there's more and more data available at, uh, at the local level uh, and, and it's really an exploding field. So I think uh, doing stuff, uh, doing spatial economics in general is, 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 uh, is interesting because there's lots of, of course, interesting questions, but it's also a promising, uh, a promising field because the data are just uh, uh, getting better and better uh, over time, right? And so I think it, it still requires some doses of uh, creativity, uh, but when you kind of look around, uh, and you look at how people are creative, it's, it's really quite, uh, quite amazing. Uh, uh, there was recently a paper, uh, I don't remember where it was published, uh, by some uh, economists uh, looking at how we can use uh, historical spatial data to uh, think about some of the big questions of uh, economic history, right? And so people are using all kinds of map technologies and all kinds of ways of trying to get uh, information at the local level, you know, even going back to say 19th, 18th century, 
so so it's a, it's a very it's it's a very uh, it's a very exciting uh, it's a very exciting field uh, to uh, to be in. Uh, your second question on on prices uh, in general, I, I think there's two things here. One is uh, in general uh, we all know that. Uh, in bigger cities, there is more competition for land. And so land prices go up and that translates into higher housing prices, uh, but it just typically also translates into higher prices in general. Uh, and so a lot of urban economists kind of simplify things and just focus on, uh, on uh, house prices as a kind of proxy, a kind of all encompassing proxy of measuring uh, the cost of density that 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 goes to through the land price, uh, but 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 you're right. With that, not everything is said, right? There's also evidence, for instance, that bigger cities uh, uh, have more competition, right? So because they have more competition, the prices of certain things may actually also be lower, right? So land prices are higher, but it, that doesn't mean that the price of every single uh, product you buy is necessarily higher. So, so there's also a fascinating literature, I think, on, uh, on size of market, size of local market, degree of competition, how that feeds into prices, how that feeds into uh, innovation, et cetera, et cetera. Any, uh, any other questions? I have a quick one for you. I think it's a quick one from Somesh Matur in the, in the Q&A. Do we have some better indices than, um, than indices of spatial dispersion? So um, obviously Hirschman, Hirschleifer, um, but what kind of indices do we have of dispersion among manufacturing and services that are useful at looking at locations? So I would say two things. So if, if you just want to have one statistic, um, Yes, so you know you use the the Hirschleifer index. You can look at uh, at of course the variance or the coefficient of variation or the difference between the 80th and the 20th percentile. So all the sort of standard all all, all, all the sort of standard measures. But I'll uh, but 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 what is true as well is that sometimes it is actually useful to look at the entire distribution. Right. And so you may sometimes be surprised. You may think, well, everything is said by increasing or decreasing dispersion. Uh, but when you look at the entire distribution, uh, you may see some uh, things you, you didn't expect. Right. So it may very well be that that, for example, again, that that maybe these medium sized places are uh, are becoming uh, are doing particularly well. And that the, the, the both the biggest and the smallest and the, the medium small are not doing that well. And so, so I would always recommend to the extent possible, rather than immediately going to a uh, summary statistic like the ones we mentioned, uh, I would I would plot the entire distribution just to see, hey, is there anything else that's interesting? So you could, for example, have a situation where the tail is becoming a lot fatter or where the tail is not becoming where the tail is becoming thinner. Maybe the, maybe the action is over there, right? And then maybe looking at dispersion or concentration is not really the right way of looking at the data, right? And so that's, that, would be my, uh, that would be my recommendation. I think I should probably, in the interest of time, there's, there's still always last questions coming in, but I think in the interest of time, we should probably close things out. And so I'd like to thank you, Klaus, and I'd also like to turn things over to my, my partner in crime, Joe Kaboski, to close out today's lecture and, and really, I guess, to close out the whole set of lectures. So um, my thanks, Klaus, and, and maybe others can join me first before I turn it over to Joe. Maybe those in the front row can do what we've been doing and unmute. And let's give Klaus a, a round of um, real, as close to real applause as we can. Uh, yeah, thank you all. It was it was it was really fun, and I, I enjoyed it. And very good questions too. I I always worry in these types of uh, online settings where there's lots of people. Uh, how do you get to a uh, 
good level of engagement and interaction and i'm very happy that this part this part this part really well so thank you thanks and, and joe let me turn things over to you yeah that's a great segue into uh, what i wanted to say i mean the first is that this is the last uh, lecture of the course um uh, klaus was the headliner clean up better and um so i wanted to thank the cepr staff especially for you know everything that they've done uh, making this possible. Uh, that's um, Mandy Chan, Kirsty McNeil, McNeil, Lauren Waring, and Nadine Clark. Um, and people, you know, all through uh, CEPR. Um, this course has really been a, a grand uh, experiment, uh, not only for CEPR, but I think for the profession. I know that um, uh, next week I'm meeting with people for bread to try to uh, figure out a similar type of a course so that we can reach more people. Um, I, it's in, in our minds, in Doug's and, and my minds, it's been a tremendous success. I've learned a ton uh, just from sitting in on these lectures. Um, but we want to learn more, and we'd like to get feedback from the students. So we will be sending out, uh, and, and maybe as well from the lecturers, uh, we'll, we'll be sending out an evaluation uh, I think both uh, maybe with an anonymous part and a uh, identified part, because uh, we'd also like to sell the idea. And so if we can get some nice quotes <laughs> uh, with names attached, that would be wonderful. Um, but we also want to learn how to improve the course. Uh, are there ways to, like Klaus said, are there ways to improve engagement? Um, we, we need to find out, uh, you know, where things went right and where they went wrong. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you all. Of course, it's, you know, always the people that hang on until the very end are only a fraction of the overall people. Um, but I wanted to thank you guys especially. And uh, please give us feedback so we can learn from this. Thanks, Klaus, as well. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. We look forward to hearing from you all and to staying in touch. So many, many thanks to all the students, all the people who've been attending. It's, it's, uh, it's been great to get to know many of you over the past weeks, too. So look forward to staying in touch. Bye, everyone.